Okay, hello class. This is my alternate classroom experience due to all these snow days and spring break. Um, so what we're going to be doing for the next couple of days over this spring break is talking about, um, or I should say continuing our conversation about imperialism. Um, but it's going to look a little bit different than what we've been talking about over the past couple of days in terms of American imperialism and it happening before the 20th century. So we're actually going to be watching a documentary that has to do with the effects of imperialism. Um, but there's a lot that goes with it that I want you to understand before you actually watch the documentary and it's based on the Rwandan genocide. So in order to understand, because in the documentary it doesn't actually say um, that this is a direct result of imperialism, but in fact it actually is. And we have talked about the Rwandan genocide very briefly during the talk about Native Americans and whether or not that's considered a genocide, but this is going to go into more depth about what Rwandan genocide is and then how it's related to imperialism. So that's kind of the purpose of right now um, and, and you watching this video. And the sub should have handed out a sheet um, that is entitled uh, pre, it says Ghost of Rwanda, and there should be a do now on it with the background information. That's the sheet that we're going to be looking at while you watch this video of myself. Um, and you're going to be using that to take some notes about, you know, like the Rwanda genocide, some terms to understand for the documentary, and just emphasizing how it relates to imperialism. So, if you could actually, I have posted on Classroom the sheet that is, a or the worksheet that's called Pre-Ghosts of Rwanda. Just go into that, and then there's a link for a Prezi. Just click on that, and then while you're watching, you don't even need to have my face up while you're watching the presentation, but... Um, you can just listen to my voice as I go through it. And then using the sheet that was given to you, you should write down the notes. So I know that I posted on Classroom the pre-Ghosts of Rwanda worksheet, but it's also printed for you, and I did that because I want you to write it. So um, before you even begin watching, going through and watching this video, why don't you just put me on pause for a second and then answer the do now question. So it's just saying in three to four sentences, explain right now your impression and like what impact you think imperialism has or can have on a particular nation, whether you think it's positive or negative. And I want you to be sure to explain your answer because um, this is a pretty heavy topic um, and it can go either way. So just put me on pause and then you can resume me for the rest of the class. Okay, so I'm sure that a lot of you for the do now said um, you know, like a lot of the impacts for imperialism could be that, um, you know, the nation that they are um, colonizing, that's another word that we use for imperialism, another word would, or could be a positive thing just due to the fact that they are probably a less advanced country and they need the help, they need the assistance from the government. But there's also a lot of um, problems that can come along with that and the Rwandan genocide is the perfect example of those problems. So make sure that you have the Prezi up um, and then we can begin talking about how this all connects. So the Rwandan genocide took place in the 90s so like I said before this isn't something that take, took place like in the 1800s was super long ago. This is pretty recent, um, if you will. So just clicking the arrow to the part that says Rwandan genocide is historically one of the shortest um, yet bloodiest genocides of all time. Yes, it was. That is completely true. It was only a hundred days long. Um, so just in a couple of months, they were 
killing and slaughtering 500,000 to 1 million people, um, which is about 20% of the country's population. So just kind of thinking about that, Rwanda is not, like you can see on the, um, the map that it says on this first slide, that's Rwanda, is that little square. So to have a million people annihilated is very significant especially in that short amount of time you know you've got thinking like comparing it to the holocaust you've got like yes yeah, six million people were killed in that that genocide and that is a very significant number but that stretches all through germany all through poland into austria hungary or i should say austria um so it's not just like that's a bigger range whereas this is just super condensed when it comes to people. So then uh, push the arrow for the next one. So the two groups that were in Rwanda at the time were called the Hutus and the Tutsis. So we have talked about this. This should be the thing that sounds familiar to you guys because of this like one day that I briefly talked about a couple different genocides. These are the two groups that are living in Rwanda at the time. Hutus are farmers and then Tutsis are cattle farmers. So then clicking the arrow to the next one, here is a picture of the Tutsi and the Hutu. So you can see the Tutsi and the Hutu they are different physically, and that does actually matter, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So before, um, kind of before World War II, World War, or I should say World War I, uh, Germans took control before World War I, and then after World War I, Belgium gained control. So the reason for that, um, and we will talk about that as we get to our World War I discussion, but it's just because Germany had to give up all its colonies. That was part of the agreement. So it makes sense that Belgium would go in there and take control over Rwanda because Germany was, was you know, blamed for the war and things like that. So, you know, up and like throughout this whole time, regardless of war or not, you know, with the Germans there and then Belgians, they were getting along, the two ethnic groups, the Tutsis and the Hutus. They were friends, they were neighbors, they got along very well, they married each other, they were considered um, very peaceful amongst each other. And then this is just a map, so we've kind of seen something like this before, but this is, remember, um, so imperialism, we've got, like, it's nothing new for the European countries. We've just got a lot of them who are occupying the whole continent of Africa. Okay, so remember we saw that map a couple of days ago when we talked about um, imperialism in a broader sense. So this is just sort of the same thing. It's just showing how all these European countries are taking over, and then Belgium is that, that blue one right there. That's, like, right where Rwanda um, is. Okay, so um, when the Belgians, so like I said, to set the tone, Tutsis and Hutus got along. They're friendly, they're neighbors, they're living together, they're working amongst each other. Uh, everything seems to be going okay until the Belgians colonists get there. Okay, so you should be on the next slide, or you should be on the slide that says um, in the small central Afri African country of Rwanda. It's blue and yellow, and it's got a circle on it. So there was a deep running history of tensions between the two major ethnic groups. So this is not suggesting that, because, you know, like I just said, I'm not contradicting what I just said and how they got along. The reason why there is high tensions is because there are two, um, or I'm sorry, because the Belgian colonists came there and they started to favor one group over the other. So I think I mentioned that in a PowerPoint beforehand, but basically what they did was when they got there, they noticed, so, you know, that picture that we saw about how the Tutsis and the Hutus look different physically, they noticed the same thing. Like, it's pretty obvious that there's two different people here who come from two different ethnic groups. So we're going to identify them. We're going to create identity cards, which you can see in the PowerPoint that specif uh, specified the two ethnicity groups. So basically, it's separating them. It's identifying like, okay, so we're going to, if you're wearing blue, then you're a Tutsi. If you're wearing red, then you're a Hutu. Like they, I mean, obviously it's a card, so it's different. But just to give that sense, they're already creating that divide. 
So the Belgians originally considered the Tutsi superior to the Hutus because um, they had more of a majority. There were more Tutsis than there were Hutus. Um, and so they kind of saw the Tutsis as like stronger, thinner, they had narrow faces. We'll look at the differences and how they identified them differently in just a little while. Um, but yeah, so then in 1962, Rwanda becomes independent. So we're not really focusing on the idea that like how the Belgians treated everyone. The main thing is that Belgians came in when they were coming in, everybody was getting along great, everything was going fine, but now there's like tension because they're separating because the Belgians are putting Tutsis here and then Hutus here. Um, so once, uh, so just to click your arrow um, twice, so you should pass the one, I mean with the identity card picture and then just go to the next one. So um, the reasoning why, so this can go in your box, your chart that talks about um, the differences between the two. Tutsis were favored because they looked more European. They had lighter skin tones and sharper noses. So I guess the Belgians just came in and were like, this is the group that we can identify more closely with in terms of physical attributions. But um, as a result, the Hutus were seen as su inferior. So then just click to the next arrow and it says the stereotype of tall, light, superior Tutsis and short, dark, inferior Hutus came from a British explorer. So yes, like they're obviously labeling the two and saying like they're better because they're taller and they're thinner and they're lighter, but the Hutus are less, they're inferior because they're darker, they're shorter, they're wider. Um, and then, so we can just skip to the next one, um, and then to these pictures. So just kind of looking at these pictures of the stereotypical Tutsi and Hutu, uh, you can see that the first three are Tutsi, so one, two, three on top, and then four, five, six are the same person, just like a side view, and then f uh, seven, eight, nine, those are Hutus. So you can see, like, that's what the Belgians favored in terms of, I mean, whatever reason, they just thought that they look more European because they're slimmer, their noses are slimmer, but the Hutus, you can see that they're wider. And that's the stereotype that they placed on them saying like the, you know, if you look like a Hutu, then you're inferior basically. Okay, so you can go to the next one. Um, as time went on though, you know, like I said, they were very close, in close quarters, right? So they got along very well. A lot of them married each other. But as tensions continue to rise, like if a Hutu and a Tutsi married, the child still had like Tutsi blood in it. So during the genocide, even if you had like a Hutu father and you had a Tutsi mother, you would be killed because you have some sort of Tutsi lineage in you. So, um, so then as the, so then you can click to the next slide, um, and it just kind of says, like, Belgians came and they measured the length of the, no of the nose between the Hutus and the Tutsis, and they basically, like, were making fun of the Hutus because they had such wide noses. And basically a Hutu's nose on average was 2.5 millimeters longer than a Hutu. Why that makes you inferior to a, or superior to another person is beyond my understanding, but that's just what the Belgians believed at the time. Um, okay, so clicking to the next one. So you should be on the slide that says Hutus targeted the Tutsis long before 1994. Um, so this is just giving background. So Belgians left in 1962. Yes, they left, but all the tension between the two groups didn't fade away. They were all, the Hutus were still kind of bitter towards the Tutsis for the treatment that they had to endure for a long time. So they did in fact have, um, you know, different types of killings between certain years. So you can see uh, there were plenty killed between 1963 and 1967, but it's not, 
I mean, nobody really went in there and thought it was a problem. So switching to the next, you can click the arrow, you should be on Hutus were instigators. So this is about the genocide. Likely that about half of the deaths during the Rwandan killings were Hutus, meaning that they were the ones doing the killings. Um, so they were a very poor country to begin with. So most of them were done by the closest tools that they could find. So this is pretty significant because, you know, when it comes to the Holocaust, uh, you know, Germany was a very advanced country at the time. And Hitler, you know, more advanced meaning like they went through the Industrial Revolution and they experienced all those things. Like they were a country that was the more advanced taking over the less advanced. So they had different equipment like machine guns. They had those gas tanks. They are gas chambers. They could kill a lot of people all at once because they had all of those tools to do it, right? So you could shove 20, this is a horrible thing to say, but you could shove 20 people into a gas chamber and then in those moments, 20 people die. But the fact that Rwanda is a poor country and they're using these less advanced weapons like machetes, knives, spears, like they, um, a hippopotamus hide whip. I don't even know what that is, but um, the fact that they're just using those to do their killings and the amount of people that they were able to kill is very significant. It just shows and emphasizes how, um, you know, brutal and gory this whole period was. It was very violent. So moving on to the next slide, um, this is just a picture just showing like, I guess these are different machetes. Um, this is, I mean, this is what the picture from the child labor thing that we did, the, the little kid with the machete chopping down the cocoa um, things. That's the same weapon that they used here. So it's not, I mean, it's used for other things, but they're using it for killing. So then moving on, We've got April 6, 1994. This is when the Rwandan president was, he, his plane was shot down. And it was by, um, so they don't really know who did it, but pretty much everybody blamed the Tutsis. And everybody, I mean the Hutus. They automatically blamed the Tutsis. So it's kind of like comparing it to how the U.S. and Spain during the Spanish-American War, how they had those the high tensions before the war broke out. It's kind of the, and like when the USS Maine blew up, we automatically blamed Spain. It's the same idea. So this thing happened. Nobody actually knows who did it, but the Hutus automatically blamed the Tutsis. So this was sort of the immediate cause to a bigger problem. It's like over the years you've got all this tension and then it's like that one thing that just kind of explodes. Like if you are really stressed about your schoolwork for months and months and months and then all of a sudden something happens and it just all comes down, it's like in that moment that's how it begins. Um, so skipping to the next one, you can also... Well, for this is just talking about the Hutu gang. They can, they called themselves a gang. Um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the word, but it's those who attack together. So it's a gang that's basically ganging up on the Tutsis to kill them. So skipping to the next one, you should be on the Hutus created the Ten Commandments. And this is a list of rules that were created against the Tutsis. So I won't read you all of them, but just like Hutu, a Hutu is a traitor if he married a Tutsi woman, befriends a Tutsi woman, hires a Tutsi woman. So any sort of association with a Tutsi, you are a traitor to the Hutu gang. Um, so these are the Ten Commandments that they followed when it came to their killings. If they discovered a, um, if they discovered a Hutu who was, you know, a traitor, then they would be basically annihilated as well. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so this is about the actual genocide. So 800,000 to 1 million Tutsis were killed in 100 days. More than six men, women, and children were murdered every minute of every hour of every day. So just to let that sink in, um, that's extremely violent. So more than six 
men, women, and children were murdered every minute of every hour of every day. It's just, I mean, the killings were nonstop. It was super violent. This is why they label this genocide to be one of the most, the bloodiest. Um, the Hotel Rwanda, so just like a hotel that people stayed at, this is actually was turned into a movie, but it, it's famous because it hid um, 1,268 people, and originally that's how many people would be killed in about four hours. So again, I mean, maybe the numbers in comparing comparing it to a million people, you know, 1,000 people doesn't seem like that many, but that's how many they killed in just a couple of hours. So between 250,000 and 500,000 women were raped, um, and you know, pretty the survivors. I mean. Most people, if you did survive, it's not like you could, you were likely to find your family, right? So you were orphaned if you were a child, basically. So moving, um, so yeah, this slide just basically emphasizes the violence and the goriness behind it. But you can press the arrow to the next one, so you should be the UN's involvement. So this is the slide that I actually want to familiarize you with before you actually move to the film. Um, but basically, the United Nations, so the United Nations was formed after the Holocaust, to put things into perspective. If you need to write this down, that's okay. Um, the UN was formed after the Holocaust, and it's basically to settle it's like an organization, a peace international organization that helps solve problems, okay? So it's like a peace-making organization. Still exists today. Um, many countries are involved. And so why it was created was after World War II, obviously you've got the devastation from that war, but then you also have... Um, the devastation from the Holocaust, which really left something with the people. And they were like, How, what are we going to do in order to make sure that this never happens again and this, you know, can we can try and prevent some sort of genocide like this? Because after the Holocaust, that's when genocide became an actual word with a definition. Um, and so the United Nations purpose is basically to prevent things like this happening. So when there is a genocide that breaks out, you know, it's very, they're very hesitant to call it a genocide because as soon as they call it a genocide, the UN has to get involved. Like, that's part of the thing. So for a lot of genocides that have taken place along history, they have been hesitant to call it that, even though it's very clear, like, that's what it is because then the UN has to get involved and it's like, how do you pay for that? Who's going to help? Who's going to send more troops? So, um, but for this... They, for the outbreak of this genocide, the UN deployed about 2,500 troops into Rwanda. So they did actually make an attempt to um, fix it, but um, I mean, again, like this was a little bit into the problem. So they were having a harder time settling it. Okay, so moving to the next slide, you can just skip that one. Um, so in the aftermath of the genocide, so like I said, the Rwandan government refused to call it a genocide, insisting that it was merely a civil war. So it is kind of like, how do you differentiate? Because, you know, they are two different groups in America fighting against each other. So it's like, how do you compare, you know, like the North and the South for the Civil War? How can you compare? I mean, you can compare it, but the difference is, is that the Tutsis were completely, like, they didn't know how to defend themselves. And the way that the Hutus were fighting was over something much, it seems like a much smaller conflict than the Civil War. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like the Tutsis were more defenseless when it came to this genocide. So it is called a genocide, um, despite the fact that the Rwandan government refused to call it that. So going to the legacy of the genocide, um, so obviously there are still the two people groups who are um, living there now, and so they have to figure out a way to 
you know, live in peace. So the legacy of the genocide, um, families were torn apart. One in four households in Rwanda are now headed by children. So thinking about how, you know, like before we said that they were orphaned, they had no family. Um, I mean, that is not good for the country. I mean, how can children raise their families. About 200,000 uh, children were like born due to rape. So it's not like this is, you know, the, um, I'm trying to think of the right word for it, but the, I mean, underlying like hurt and you know, problems that are there because of this, they're still having the repercussions. This was over 20 years ago, but we're still finding that they are suffering. Um, so that will conclude this background. Hopefully, if you have any questions, I know that this way of presenting the information is very different from obviously me being there so that if you do have questions, we can just stop in you know, talk about it. If you have questions, please, there's a place on your, on your, um, what's it called? Your worksheet, uh, to ask me any questions because I do want to know what your questions are. Cause like I said, this is a very heavy, heavy topic. And the Rwandan genocide is a very, very gory, violent thing that took place in history. And this video that you're going to be watching does display that. So, um, Please write down any questions that you have. Um, the sub should be passing out a additional, an additional uh, question sheet for you to fill out while you're watching the video. Um, and then if you want, like while you're watching the video, if you're confused about some things, you can use that same sheet that you just took notes on to... Uh, continue to ask questions. So if you're confused about the United Nations, they will mention that in the video, so it's not like that's not going to be mentioned. It will be mentioned. If you're confused by that, just let me know, and maybe we can clear things up when I when we return to our normal schedule. Um, but with that being said, please Please put, you know, anything else away for this video. I have informed the sub that nothing should be out. It is a very, very disturbing topic that should not be just kind of like, oh, I'm going to be fiddling and doing other things while watching this video. I want you to really get it in and mainly think about how all of this is because of imperialism. That's where it all comes back to is, okay, this is a, a direct effect of how imperialism impacted a smaller, less advanced, less civilized um, country. Okay, so that's kind of what you need to be keeping in mind through this. And thinking about maybe how does, how are there cases around the world that are similar to Rwanda? Are there other cases that are similar to Rwanda? Um, there absolutely are. So just kind of keeping that in mind of while you're watching the documentary. Okay, please enjoy the video.